Ros, I wonder whether you'd uh, tell us and explain to us about polygenic risk scores and SNPs. So when we look at the variation in the human genome, we all look slightly different in terms of our eye colour and so on because our gene code is different. There are several different types of variation and some variants are very, very common. They're called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. A lot of them are just a single letter changed to another one. There are many millions of them. Um, and they like the, um, say, variation across the genome that is shuffled between the generations, a bit like playing a game of bridge. If you've got a family around a table, they might all have a different collection of SNPs and therefore a different collection of risks from those SNPs. So polygenic risk scores are each individual SNPs association of risk with disease. This is associated with, say, disease or a trait. Um, and those risks t tend in the main to be what we call log additive or multiplicative. So it's a bit like adding up the points of car cards in a bridge game. So each individual can have a different score. At the moment, we don't know how useful they're going to be for human health. We think they probably will be useful for stratifying different levels of risk in a population. For example, at the Institute of Cancer Research, we're looking at our profile of over 150 of these SNPs or variants across the genome to stratify men in a population of level of risk of prostate cancer. And we're using that to offer them different screening studies. It's just fascinating what you've been achieving. So I sort of think of them like little building blocks in particular positions and you add up the little value of each of them and that you've discovered where the position is them in somebody's genome, say for a prostate cancer risk you add them all up, get the polygenic risk score, and that's often divided into centiles when you get the total addition. And if you're, say, something like the 98th centiles, then you're very high risk. And I'd be very interested to learn from you the different variations. So if you have a 98th centile for prostate cancer from your SNPs, what sort of risk would that give you compared to the normal? Um, it depends which uh, population you're from. So, for example, if you're from a European population, if you're in the top 98th percentile or above, your risks can even be as high as over six to tenfold yeah. compared with the average of the population. So the risks can be quite high. And you're currently looking at about 270 SNPs, aren't you, for prostate cancer? Yeah, so the over 150 that I quoted you are the ones that were solid for yeah. typing in the European population, but we've just worked together with a group in California to uh, bring together a profile that's across what we call multi-ethnic populations, so it would work in both populations that are European origin, men of African origin and also of Asian origin. And you, you discovered about two-thirds of the world, or is it three-quarters of the world's prostate SNPs? Through this, through this yeah. uh, international collaboration, yes. Um, so we've discovered that many. Mm. So essentially, we have genes that can increase our risk of cancer, that's single monogenes, and we have SNPs. And so if, when you're assessing somebody for their cancer risk genetically, you want to have both features. And so together in our study, we've done for prostate cancer, which you just described. But it's interesting, isn't it, for ovarian cancer, the SNPs are very small contribution to that cancer risk, aren't they, probably? Yes, we don't know why this is, is that, is that some cancers have a greater contribution from SNPs, like prostate cancer has a very large contribution, well over a third, in terms of its genetic risk. Whereas with ovarian cancer, it's a much smaller proportion, and, and most of the ovarian cancer risk that's due to genetic alteration is due to alterations in single genes, that are, each of them are of a much higher risk. Such so as the BRCA genes them. and mm. other genes and Lynch syndrome genes and uh, RAD51 and D and C, etc. So it's very interesting that when you look at, say, breast cancer, uh, trying to find people at higher risk, isn't it? It's about half SNPs and about half uh, major genes. Again, things like uh, BRCA genes, which are associated with breast cancer and many of the other genes so now if we do a breast cancer panel for genes, we'll probably do at least 12 different individual genes. So that if you're looking at cancer risk, you want to basically have SNPs and you want to have uh, the single genes as well. And that's the best way really of assessing this, I suppose. That's why the whole genome study, I think, is such a nice study 
because you get the whole genome, you get all the information in one go. You don't have to do panel after panel and then do a SNP panel and then put it all together. And also, it is very likely that the SNP panels will get wider and wider as more data become available. And so we're very pleased to have seen the results and to talk about the results, uh, to be honest, they pretty well bowled us over because we had two particular patients who'd had uh, uh, colon cancer at very young ages. And uh, could you share a little bit about their SNP values? Yeah, so uh, in some individuals in the study, uh, we didn't find an alteration in high-risk single gene analyses in the gene panels. And then we found that they were at the higher end of the polygenic risk score. So, for example, one of them was in the 98th percentile. So if you had 98 men, sorry, 100 men in a room, this, these, these particular patients were in the, in the absolute right-hand side of the, of the distribution of the risk. So it is possible that their polygenic risk score has contributed to their early onset colon cancer. I mean, more work needs to be done to prove that that really is the case, that there isn't another gene that we haven't yet discovered that could be contributing as well. Um, but we have started to find results like this. So the modelling does, does seem to be, be um, predictive. Now, I think for both cases, um, one of them had a, a weak gene, an APC gene, that increased the risk twofold, whereas the polygenic risk of for score basically gave them a 3.78-fold increased risk. And when these, however you think they interact, whether they're additive or something else, they certainly do interact. And it should explain probably why this patient had had it, isn't it? So there are other examples in the literature, for example, with BRCA, high risk alterations where they do interact with the polygenic risk score and that is now published and it's proven. With this particular alteration that we found in this individual in the APC gene it's not thought to be a very high risk mutation, a high risk alteration. Some other, other alterations in APC are high risk and this particular alteration gives about a twofold risk of colon cancer and uh, it is not known if that's interacted with his polygenic risk score. But because we know that this phenomenon does exist, it seems very likely that that may be what's happening in this individual. And they had colon cancer at a very young age. Yes. And this, this implies, therefore, that as we get the whole genome data and we get more information in the future, it means we will, go back to some, we will be able to go back to somebody's genome and actually say we have more information about how all this interacts and these are the new bits of information for you. So the lovely thing about the whole genome study is you don't have to resequence the person, you just re-look at the data and give them more information. Yeah. And I've been pretty stunned too by some of the prostate results. So we had a prostate patient who, we call him a prostate patient, but he's, he's just a normal person like you or I, but he's got a higher prostate risk and the SNP uh, score basically when added gave him a polygenic risk score that put him at sixfold risk and so that sort of brings us into your work which you, you do a study called barcode one could you explain about that yes we're doing a study of, to look at how you might use polygenic risk scores in the general population to target screening it is research at the moment it's being done at the Biomedical Research Centre at the Institute of Cancer Research in the Royal Marsden. So we have a prostate risk clinic and men who are over 55 in the general population are offered a SNP profile. And those in the top 10%, in other words, in the 90th percentile or above in the polygenic risk score, are offered an MRI and a biopsy. And that's irrespective of their blood marker, the PSA marker. Um, we know already from a pilot study that's just been published in the British Journal of Urology International that this study is feasible, that it's acceptable, and that we are seeing a higher number of cancers, but the data are very early. So it's, it's really a large move, isn't it, feeling one can find these people at much higher risk by a simple blood test that's different to PSA and different to examination. Um, I think we do need to do further work to see what the ideal mix of the algorithm should be. Should we use the polygenic risk score, for example, at certain ages, and then add in MRI to a certain group, and maybe in another group actually go straight to prostate biopsy? And those, those questions are not yet answered. That's what we're trying to answer in these studies. And another area I found very interesting in our discussions is your sharing that 
quite a lot of these people in these high polygenic prostate terrace well, centiles, they don't necessarily always have high PSAs and their MRIs may not show their prostate cancer either and you just get it on the biopsy. So these uh, polygenic risk scores have landed up finding a group which would be otherwise very hard to find who are at high risk. Is, is that the correct sort of interpretation? That's the aim of the study. That's the aim of the whole of the ethos of using polygenic risk scores. I think we haven't yet proven whether it's the correct approach, but the modelling suggests it will be the correct approach. There's, there's modelling by one of my colleagues, Nora Pashine at UCL, uh, which suggests that it actually might reduce what we call overdiagnosis, which is the finding of prostate cancer cases that would never progress. We want to find cases that need treatment that would threaten somebody's lifespan. Which I think is fascinating is because we often discuss that if you're an enthusiast for prostate cancer screening, you probably think you have to treat six people to save one person's life. It will often, it will obviously depend on how aggressive that disease is. So if you get very aggressive disease, you may need to operate on two people to save a person's life, where as disease is so-called Gleason 3 plus 3, which is the two most common areas of histological histological abnormality added together, which forms a squeezing score. So when you have scores that aren't very high, these people do very well over a period of 10 years, even if you don't do anything. So it's your cleverness in trying to make prostate cancer screening work so those people who undergo treatments don't suffer the side effects of the treatments unnecessarily, really, isn't it? That's, that's the plan with using the polygenic risk scores, because you find more cases, there, are, there should be more aggressive cases in the higher centiles. And, and they should be enriched for the number of cases that are aggressive and therefore do need treatment. Um, and therefore, we're hoping that you therefore might need to treat fewer individuals to prolong life because the aggressive cases mm. are more likely to shorten life if you don't treat them. Yeah. Well, I think Ros, one just has to congratulate you on you know, your immense talent of work and the way of changing the whole ideas about prostate cancer in the future. Well, I just want to make a comment that you, this type of research you can't do with, without being in big groups, a big consortium, so it's, a, it's a, hundreds of groups across the world that work together. And the other thing is that this firmly sits, in my view, in primary care, and that's why working here at 90 Sloan Street has just been revolutionary. <laughs> Very kind. Thank you, Ros.